Συγγνώμη. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good morning and welcome to this, the sixth European Summit of Regions and Cities. My name is Karen Coleman. I am an Irish journalist, and it is my great pleasure to co-moderate today's debate with my Greek colleague, Ilias Siakantaris. Thank you, Karen. Over the next couple of hours, we will debate the future of Europe. We are going to uh, focus on the economic and social situation in the European Union in general and in Greece in particular. We will debate also the democratic legitimacy of the EU, especially in the light of the upcoming uh, European Parliament elections. And we will ask what will be the future, future challenges of the EU and how they can be tackled. And in a short time to participate in this debate, we will be joined by the President of the Committee of the Regions, Ramon Luis Valcarcel, Mr. Yves Leterme, the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, and Mr. Antonio Costa, Mayor of Lisbon. And later on, we will hear from the President of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, who will make a keynote address. But before that, I will invite the Governor of the Attica region, Mr. Ioannis Gouros, who will present his opening remarks. Dear President of the European Union, Κύριε Πρόεδρε της Επιτροπής Περιφερειών, κυρίες και κύριοι Υπουργοί, κυρίες και κύριοι Ευρωβουλευτές, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι του πρώτου και του δεύτερου βαθμού, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι στην Επιτροπή των, στην Επιτροπή των Περιφερειών, επίσημοι προσκεκλημένοι, κυρίες και κύριοι, η Περιφέρεια Αττικής σας καλωσορίζει στην Αθήνα στην έκτη διάσκεψη κορυφής των περιφερειών και των πόλεων της Ευρώπης. Σήμερα είναι μια σημαντική μέρα. Μια μέρα συζήτησης. Μια μέρα για τους Ευρωπαίους πολίτες. Μια συζήτηση για τις ελπίδες τους, τις ανησυχίες τους, από μια Ευρώπη που στοχάζεται, προβληματίζεται, αναζητά το δρόμο που μας πάει πιο κοντά στο σήμερα και στο αύριο. Στην αίθουσα αυτή του Μεγάρου Μουσικής Αθηνών, εκπρόσωποι από όλες τις περιφέρειες και τις πόλεις της Ευρώπης, μαζί με τους επικεφαλείς όλων των θεσμικών οργάνων της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι της Επιτροπής των Περιφερειών, πρόεδροι των Περιφερειών και δήμαρχοι των πόλεων, μας θυμάτε με την παρουσία σας, με την παρουσία σας και σας ευχαριστούμε θερμά. Ας αναζητήσουμε σήμερα, στα δύσκολα αυτά χρόνια, την αρχή του νήματος του Ευρωπαϊκού Εγχειρήματος. Πριν από έξι δεκαετίε. Πάνω στα ερήπια μιας κατηκερματισμένης και τραυματισμένης Ευρώπης, έξι χώρες είχαν ένα όραμα που φάνταζε ουτοπικό. Να δημιουργήσουν μια κοινότητα κρατών που θα αναζητούσε μια κοινή πορεία με οικονομική, κοινωνική, πολιτική ασφάλεια και σταθερότητα για τους πολίτες. Που θα άφηνε πίσω της τις αντιπαραθέσεις, τις συγκρούσεις και τους πολέμους που βήθησαν την Ευρωπαϊκή Ήπειρο στο σκοτάδι. Η ιδέα της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης είναι μια ιστορικά εκρηκτική και πρωτοπόρος ιδέα που με τρόπο καινοτόμο και ανατρεπτικό, δημιουργικό, γράφει ένα από τα πιο σημαντικά κεφάλαια της σύγχρονης ανθρώπινης ιστορίας. Γνωρίζουμε την εξέλιξη. Αυτή η ιδέα ρίζωσε, αναπτύχθηκε και φτάνοντας στη σημερινή της μορφή έδωσε τους καρπούς της ανάπτυξης, της ευμάρειας και της ελληνικής συνύπαρξης. Πέρασε κρίσεις, γνώρισε υποχωρήσεις και επανεκκινήσει. Αλλά προχώρησε. Αυτό είναι το σημαντικό. Σήμερα χρειάζεται να πάμε αυτήν την ιδέα ένα βήμα πιο μπροστά. Ποτέ, αγαπητοί φίλοι, ο κόσμο δεν μένει στάσιμο. Σήμερα νέε ανάγκε έχουν διαμορφωθεί, νέα προβλήματα έχουν αναδειχθεί και νέα αιτήματα προβάλλουν για την Ευρώπη. Σήμερα, όσο ποτέ, η μεγάλη ευρωπαϊκή ιδέα χρειάζεται να κάνει ένα βήμα μπροστά. Αποφασιστικό, όριμο, συνειδητοποιημένο. Ένα βήμα στον πραγματικό σύγχρονο κόσμο, όπως αυτό ορίζεται από τις συνθήκες της εποχής. Η Ευρώπη πασχίζει να βρει τους τρόπους να δημιουργήσει τους θεσμούς προκειμένου να ανταποκριθεί στην κρίση, 
Δεν είναι η Ευρώπη της συνθήκης του Μάστρικ, ούτε η Ευρώπη της συνθήκης του Άμστερνταμ. Όμως, η Ευρώπη προχωράει. Αναζητά και αναδεικνύει νέες λύσεις, θεσμικές και ουσιαστικές. Γι' αυτό εξάλλου σήμερα βρισκόμαστε όλοι εδώ. Εμείς, οι σημερινοί Ευρωπαίοι, Έχουμε την υποχρέωση να ευανθύνουμε, να ενδυναμώσουμε και να ζωογονήσουμε την ευρωπαϊκή ιδέα. Μια ιδέα που στηρίζεται στο άνοιγμα στις διεθνείς προκλήσεις, αλλά και στην έμπρακτη, όχι διακηρυκτική αλληλεγγύη. Να εμπλουτίσουμε την Ευρώπη με περισσότερα ποιοτικά χαρακτηριστικά, δίνοντας νόημα σε αυτό που θα μπορούσαμε να ονομάσουμε ευρωπαϊκό πρότυπο, ευρωπαϊκό τρόπο αντίληψης και ζωής. Μόνο έτσι μπορούμε να χτίσουμε μια νέα εμπιστοσύνη γύρω από αυτό που έχουμε συνηθίσει να ονομάζουμε ευρωπαϊκό όραμα, ώστε η σχέση των πολιτών με την Ευρώπη να γίνει πιο στέρεη, πιο δυνατή. Αφετηρία νέα έμπνευση και νέας δημιουργίας. Πρέπει να καλυφθεί το χάσμα που υπάρχει ανάμεσα στην Ευρώπη των Βρυξελών από την Ευρώπη των πολιτών. Σε δύο μόλις μήνες έχουμε τις ευρωεκλογές. Στιγμή πολιτικά βαρισήμαντη, στην οποία ο πολίτης, ο πολίτης της κάθε χώρας, αλλά μαζί και πολίτης της Ευρώπης, έρχεται αντιμέτωπος με τον εαυτό του με την ίδια την ευθύνη του. Η αποχή, η αδράνεια, η απάθεια όσων εφησυχάζουν είναι η χαρά όσων είναι αντίθετη στην ιδέα της ευρωπαϊκής ενοποίησης, όσοι επιθυμούν μια Ευρώπη διαιρημένη και διαμελισμένη. Είναι μια μοναδική ευκαιρία να απευθυνθούμε ξανά στους Ευρωπαίους πολίτες και να τους πείσουμε πως έχουμε ένα νέο όραμα για την Ευρώπη. Ποτέ άλλωστε η αποστασιοποίηση και ο σκεπτικισμό των πολιτών ως προς τα τεχτενόμενα στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση δεν ήταν τόσο έντονα. Πιστέψτε με και μιλάω από μια χώρα όπου η θετική άποψη για την Ευρώπη και τις προπτικές της ήταν σε επίπεδα από τα πιο υψηλά. Αυτή η αποστασιοποίηση, αυτός ο σκεπτικισμό δεν είναι επιδερμικό φαινόμενο. Αποτυπώνουν μια βαθύτερη αίσθηση έλλειψης και αυτή η έλλειψη είναι έλλειψη στη θέση του μέλλοντος. Με αυτή την αφετηρία, η Περιφέρεια Αττικής αποφάσισε να διοργανώσει τη διάσκεψη κορυφή της Αθήνας μαζί με την Ευρώπη των Περιφερειών της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Και πάλι, κύριε Πρόεδρε, θέλω να σας ευχαριστήσω για την απόλυτη εμπιστοσύνη που δείξατε να γίνει στην Αθήνα η διάσκεψη κορυφή και όλους τους συναδέλφους στην Επιτροπή των Περιφερειών. Πάνω από 800 αιρετοί εκπρόσωποι των τοπικών και περιφερειακών αρχών τη Ευρώπη είχαμε χθε την ευκαιρία να συζητήσουμε για τα κρίσιμα ζητήματα που αφορά στο μέλλον τη Ευρώπη. Διατυπώσαμε του προβληματισμού μα και αναπτύξαμε θέσει και προτάσει που αφορούν όχι μόνο την ενδυνάμωση του θεσμικού μα ρόλου, αλλά και τι ικανότητε τη Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση να ανασυντάξει τι δυνάμει τη, ώστε να αντιμετωπίσει αποτελεσματικά την παρατεταμένη κρίση. Μια κρίση που δεν είναι μόνο οικονομική, είναι πρωτίστω πολιτική και κοινωνική. Συχνά ακούμε, και είναι αλήθεια αυτό, ότι η Ευρώπη προχωρά και αναπτύσσεται από κρίση σε κρίση. Όλα τα μεγάλα θεσμικά βήματα στην Ευρώπη. Πραγματοποιήθηκαν υποπίεση. Έτσι δημιουργήθηκαν οι λειτουργίε των θεσμικών οργάνων, έτσι προέκυψαν οι μεγάλοι σταθμοί, ενιαία εσωτερική αγορά, λειτουργίε προπολογισμού, διαθροτικά ταμεία, πολιτική συνοχή, ευρωζώνη κτλ. Όμω, α προσέξουμε. Η σημερινή κρίση είναι διαφορετική ποιότητα. Η παρατεταμένη ύφεση που αντιμετωπίζουν κράτη-μέλη όπω η Ελλάδα, η πρωτοφανή ανεργία, και σα μιλώ από μια χώρα όπου η ανεργία άνοιξε, άγγιξε. Το 28% όπου η ενεργεία των νέων έφτασε στο 60%. Και φίλοι μας, οι άνεργοι δεν είναι μπροστά, είναι άνθρωποι. Δεν είναι ποσοστά, είναι άνθρωποι. Η φτώχεια και ο κοινωνικός αποκλεισμός όλο και μεγαλύτερων κοινωνικών ομάδων, όλα αυτά είναι στοιχεία που θέτουν σοβαρό κίνδυνο την νοημοποίηση των ευρωπαϊκών θεσμών και μεγαλώνουν την απόστασή τους από την καθημερινότητα, από την καθημερινότητά τους. Είναι ύφεση και η λιτότητα μονόδρομος. Υπάρχει ένα αρκτικό σχέδιο για την έξοδο από την κρίση. Πώ θα αντιμετωπιστεί η καλπάζουσα αύξηση τη ανεργία σε ολόκληρη την Ευρώπη, Μπορεί η Ευρώπη να αντιμετωπίσει αποτελεσματικά τα φαινόμενα ρατσισμού και ξενοφοβία που αυξάνονται. Τα ερωτήματα αυτά είναι κρίσιμα και καθοριστικά για το μέλλον τη Ευρώπη. Κύριε Πρόεδρε τη Επιτροπή των Περιφερειών, η Ευρώπη βρίσκεται σε ένα σταυροδρόμι. Κρίσιμο, κέριο, αποφασιστικό. Χρειαζόμαστε περισσότερη Ευρώπη. Όπω πολλοί υποστηρίζουν, ή θα αναδιπλωθούμε σε μια πιο περιορισμένη εκδοχή τη ενιαία αγορά. Δεν πρόκειται για ρητορικό ερώτημα, πρόκειται για υπαρξιακή συζήτηση. Για μένα θέλω να είμαι ξεκάθαρο. Το μέλλον τη Ελλάδα βρίσκεται όσο ποτέ άλλοτε σε μια ισχυρή Ευρώπη. Το μέλλον τη Ευρώπη δεν νοείται χωρί την Ελλάδα. Αυτή η σχέση είναι μια αδιέρετη σχέση. Όμω, κύριε Πρόεδρε, 
Πρέπει να αντιληφθείτε επίση ότι η χώρα αυτή βιώνει εδώ και μια πενταετία μια πορεία στην έρημο, ένα αληθινό για πολλού γολγοθά. Εγώ, συνομιλώντα με του ανθρώπου, ακούω καθημερινά τι επικρίσει και τι κατηγορίε των συμπατριωτών μου κατά τη Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, κατά των πολιτών, μονοδιά, πολιτικών μονοδιάστατη λιτότητα που αισθάνονται ότι απειλούν ανά πάσα στιγμή την κοινωνική ισορροπία. Ακούω του πιο απελπισμένου εκείνου που υποφέρουν να λένε στην πολιτική εξουσία. Φτάνει πια, δεν αντέχουμε άλλο. Για πολλού η κατάσταση είναι οριακού, οριακή. Ακούω και νιώθω την απογοήτευση. Σα μεταφέρω αυτήν την απογοήτευση που συνοδεύεται συχνά με θυμό, οργή και πόνο. Η ελληνική οικονομία είναι μόλι το 2% τη ευρωπαϊκή οικονομία. Δεν είναι δυνατόν επί πέντε χρόνια η Ευρώπη να μην μπορεί να δώσει λύση σε ένα τέτοιο μεγέθου πρόβλημα και να αναλώνεται σε μια άδικη, μονομερή και ηθικολογική αντιμετώπιση τη κρίση. Να επιτρέπει οι φωνέ. Που... Που... Λίγο νερό, παιδιά, σα παρακαλώ. Συγγνώμη. Η ελληνική οικονομία είναι μόλις το 2% της ευρωπαϊκής οικονομίας. Δεν είναι δυνατόν επί πέντε χρόνια η Ευρώπη να μην μπορεί να δώσει λύση σε ένα τέτοιο μέγεθος πρόβλημα και να αναλώνεται σε μια άδικη, μονομερή και ηθικολογική αντιμετώπιση της κρίσης. Να επιτρέπει φωνές που λιδερούν τον ελληνικό λαό και τον παρουσιάζουν ως μαύρο πρόβατο της παγκόσμιας οικονομίας. Να στιγματίζονται λαοί, παραδόσεις, πολιτισμοί. Οι αρχαίοι Έλληνες έλεγαν μια μεγάλη αλήθεια. Παν μέτρον άριστο. Σήμερα κάπου χάθηκε το μέτρο. Και όλοι έχουν ευθύνη. Έχουν ευθύνη και αυτοί που έπαιρναν και αυτοί που έδαναν τα δάνεια, αλλά και αυτοί που έπρεπε να επιβλέπουν και να ελέγχουν. Η παγκόσμια οικονομία, όπω γνωρίζετε, είναι ένα πολύπλοκο μηχανισμό και είναι τουλάχιστον άδικο να κατηγορεί ένα μικρό εξάρτημα όταν έχει πρόβλημα η μηχανή. Εμεί, οι αιρετοί τοπικοί εκπρόσωποι του λαού στου Δήμου και τι περιφέρειέ μα, ζούμε τι αγωνίε αυτέ από κοντά. Αντικρίζοντα του πολίτε, από του οποίου τόσε θυσίε έχουμε ζητήσει από τότε που ξέσπασε η κρίση, αντικρίζοντα νέου που στην πλειονότητά του, το είπα ήδη και σα να αναλογιστείτε την ουσιαστική, την ανθρώπινη διάσταση του φαινομένου. Είναι άνεργοι, βλέποντα επιχειρήσει να δυσκολεύονται να τα βγάλουν πέρα και βλέποντα ακόμη και τι δικέ μα διοικητικέ υπηρεσίε να είναι από τα πρώτα θύματα των μέτρων λιτότητο. Κύριε Πρόεδρε, η παρουσία σε όλων εδώ, στην ίδια αυτή αίθουσα, πρέπει να δώσει το έναυσμα για να ανοίξει ένα νέο κεφάλαιο που θα εξαλείψει τι αγωνίε και θα αναζωοποιρώσει τι προσδοκίε των πολιτών. Η Ελλάδα έχει δρομολογήσει βαθιέ διαθροτικέ μεταρρυθμίσει από τότε που ξέσπασε η κρίση. Θα αναφερθώ στο παράδειγμα τη αιρετή περιφερειακή αυτοδιοίκηση, όπου η Ελλάδα συντάσσεται με τι υπόλοιπε ευρωπαϊκέ χώρε στο ζήτημα τη οργάνωση των θεσμών. Χρειάζεται να συνάψουμε σήμερα ένα νέο σύμφωνο εμπιστοσύνη ανάμεσα στην Ελλάδα και στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση. Η εμπιστοσύνη, αυτό είναι το μόνο γνήσιο θεμέλιο στο οποίο μπορεί να στηριχθεί η συνύπαρξη μέσα σε μια πραγματικά ενωμένη Ευρώπη. Αυτό και μόνο είναι το αναγκαίο θεμέλιο μια νέα σχέση, ικανή να αντέξει αναμέτρηση με τι νέε συνθήκε. Κύριε Πρόεδρε τη Ευρωπαϊκή Επιτροπή, κύριε Πρόεδρε τη Επιτροπή των Περιφερειών, ο ελληνικό λαό είναι γενναιόψυχο. Έχει υπομείνει πολλά. Είμαι σίγουρο ότι θα καταφέρει. Εμεί, σύγχρονοι Έλληνε, το οφείλουμε στον εαυτό μα και στην ιστορία μα. Το οφείλουμε στα παιδιά μα. Όμω η χώρα μα έχει ανάγκη από εσωτερική πολιτική σταθερότητα αλλά και δουλειέ. Την ανάπτυξη δεν την παραγγέλνει. Την κατακτά με συγκεκριμένε πρωτοβουλίε, διαμορφώντα συγκεκριμένε προποθέσει με σοβαρότητα και επιμονή. Προκειμένου η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση και η Ελλάδα να επανέλθουν στον δρόμο τη οικονομική ανάπτυξη και τη απασχόληση, θα χρειαστεί οι περιφέρειε και οι Δήμοι να αναγνωριστούν σε κάθε κράτο μέλο και ιδίω στην Ελλάδα ω ένα από του πυλώνε τη ανάπτυξη. Να συνειδητοποιηθεί ότι μπορούν να προσφέρουν διέξοδο από την κρίση, να συντελέσουν στην επανεκκίνηση τη ανάπτυξη, να δώσουν σε επίπεδο κοντινό στον πολίτη πραγματικά αποτελέσματα. Η περιφέρεια Αττική, η μεγαλύτερη περιφέρεια τη χώρα. Με τη λειτουργία τη, το τεράστιο πλήθο έργων που υλοποιεί και το θετικό οικονομικό ισοζύγιο που διαθέτει, το αποδεικνύει καθημερινά και έμπρακτα σε πλήρη και αγαστή συνεργασία με την κυβέρνηση του κ. Σαμαρά. Οι περιφέρειε και οι Δήμοι αναμένουν μια δεύτερη φάση οικονομική πολιτική ένωση, εγκύτερη προ τι περιφέρειε και τι επιχειρήσει. Με τον τρόπο όμω ουσιαστικό λειτουργικό, όχι διακηρυκτικό. Μπορείτε να στηρίζετε του αιρετού εκπροσώπου τοπική αυτοδιοίκηση ω συνεπεί και αποτελεσματικού εταίρου που γνωρίζουν από κοντά. Την κατάκτηση και τι ανάγκε των πολιτών και των επιχειρήσεων, τι θέσει εργασία του αύριο και τι χρηματοδοτήσει που οι επιχειρηματίε αναμένουν. 
Η εντυπωσιακή αύξηση απορροφητικότητα του ΕΣΠΑ που επιτεύχθηκε του τελευταίου 30 μήνε, που οι αιρετέ περιφέρειε ανέλαβαν την αρμοδιότητα, το αποδεικνύει. Το αποδεικνύει. Αυτό α αποτελέσει βάθρο για να χτίσουν μια ακόμη μεγαλύτερη αποτελεσματικότητα. Οι περιφέρειε και οι Δήμοι έχουν δικαιωματικά κερδίσει τη θέση που του ανήκει στο θεματολόγιο και την ανάπτυξη και την απασχόληση. Αγαπητέ Πρόεδρε, αγαπητέ Ραμόν Λουί, οι περιφέρειε αποτελούν του πλέον πολύτιμου εταίρου Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση και του ελληνικού κράτου. Επηρεάζουν, καθορίζουν και υποστηρίζουν αποφάσει μεταφορέ στην έρευνα, την καινοτομία, το περιβάλλον, την ψηφιακή οικονομία, όλοι οι τομεί καθοριστικοί για την ανάπτυξη και τη δημιουργία θέσεων εργασία. Κυρίε και κύριοι, αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, Έλληνε και Ευρωπαίοι, την κρίση δεν νοείται να τη βλέπουμε ούτε μυρολατρικά ούτε αποστασιοποιημένα. Οι λαοί μα, ήδη από την αρχαιότητα, κατόρθωναν πάντοτε να αναγεννηθούν από τι χειρότερε ανατεραχέ και καταστάσει τη ιστορία. Η Ευρώπη είναι το μεγαλύτερο παράδειγμα ειρηνική συμβίωση και ευημερία στην παγκόσμια ανθρώπινη εξέλιξη. Όταν το λέμε αυτό, πρέπει να δρούμε από αυτήν μεγάλη αλήθεια δύναμη για τα επόμενα βήματα. Βήματα αποφασιστικότητα, βήματα αλληλεγγύη, βήματα κοινή πορεία προ μια στενότερη ένωση των λαών. Αυτή είναι η Ευρώπη που πρέπει σήμερα να ζωογονήσουμε, να αναμορφώσουμε και να προσφέρουμε στα παιδιά μα. Και δεν πρέπει, αγαπητοί φίλοι, να ξεχνάμε ποτέ, εκεί που υπάρχει μία βούληση, υπάρχει πάντοτε ένας δρόμος. Σας ευχαριστώ όλους που με ακούσατε. Thank you very much, Mr. Zouros. It is appropriate that this debate takes place in Athens. Uh, after all, this is the place where democracy was born, and it is the place that has borne the brunt of the Eurozone crisis. It is the seat of the European Rotating uh, Presidency, and it is also where the systemic addictions of the European Union became first and most apparent. It was Greece where abrupt policies produced poverty, inequality, and political extremism, turning this traditionally Europhile population to Eurosceptics. These are the challenges that the EU needs to address right now. Uh, so it is rather apt that this debate takes place here, Karen. And indeed, this morning's debate is also timely, with European elections taking place in May, amid predictions that the next European Parliament will have far more representatives from radical parties of both the extreme left and right spectrums. And these elections will also mark a change in the way the President of the European Commission will be elected. So 2014 is a year of significant change for the European Union, and a year in which a debate about its future is appropriate. So now let's start our debate and welcome onto the stage our distinguished guests, the President of the Committee of the Region, Mr. Ramon Luis Valcarcel, Mr. Yves Laterme, please take your seats, and, and Mr. Antonio Costa, the uh, Mayor of uh, Lisbon. Good morning, gentlemen. You're all very welcome. And as you're aware, of course, we are dividing today's debate into three segments. The first strand will address the jobs crisis in the European Union and how best to achieve growth and employment in the future. The second strand will address the forthcoming European elections and what the long-term vision should be for the European Union. And our final theme will concentrate on the key challenges that the EU is likely to face in the future. We're looking forward to getting your views on all of those topics. And we'll also be conducting a poll of our audience here in the hall after each segment, and we'll take some video questions as well during the debate. So now let's begin with our opening question, which is linked to our first topic, jobs and growth in the EU. Mr. Valcarcel, jobs, growth, very important topics for the European Union. As President of the Committee of the Regions, perhaps we can direct the first question to you. How do we get EU countries, their regions and cities, 
back into a position of economic growth and healthy employment? And how do we make sure that people, especially young people, can get out of the unemployment queues and back into jobs? Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días. En primer lugar, hay que decir que efectivamente uno de los grandes problemas, por no decir el más grande de los problemas que en estos momentos está padeciendo la Unión Europea, es precisamente el paro juvenil. Jóvenes cuyas generaciones son probablemente las más preparadas de toda la historia de la Unión Europea. Jóvenes que, sin embargo, y pese a ello, están viendo que no hay futuro, no hay horizonte y, como dijera el presidente Esguros, eh, carecen absolutamente de esperanza. Habría que analizar el por qué se ha llegado ahí. Es imposible del todo buscar soluciones si antes no somos conscientes de que el problema se ha originado por determinadas causas. <coughs> Las causas de todos son conocidas. El modelo económico no es el que tenía que haber sido. <coughs> Esto no pasa en la región de Murcia, de la que soy presidente, en donde además el paro juvenil está en torno al 50%. Esta causa tampoco es exclusiva de Grecia, fíjese, ni tan siquiera de la Unión Europea. Creo que el modelo económico, que en un momento determinado de la historia, la mayoría de los países del mundo decidieron que ese era el modelo adecuado y al final descubrimos que ese no era el modelo adecuado. A partir de ese momento se genera el paro. 26 millones de parados en la Unión Europea, más de 5 millones de parados jóvenes de menos de 25 años en la Unión Europea. Teníamos que haber apostado por otro modelo económico, sin duda alguna. Ahora nos hemos dado cuenta. No valía aquello y ha de valer precisamente todo modelo económico basado en la formación. Esto que tanto hablamos de la I más D, pues efectivamente... Ese era el camino que no tomamos. Aprendido el error, sabemos que hay que tomar el camino que efectivamente sea capaz de generar empleo. ¿Cómo devolver el, al joven que está en paro a una posición digna de digno trabajo? Pues, en primer lugar, apostando por el modelo y, en segundo lugar, no es fácil, yo lo sé, si no, esto ya estaría resuelto, pero es evidente que hay que sumar hay que crear sinergias de los presupuestos de los ayuntamientos locales, de las regiones, de los estados, incluso presupuestos supranacionales, capaces de orientar todos sus esfuerzos precisamente a la creación de empleo. Sumar, en definitiva, presupuesto público, sumar al presupuesto público también la iniciativa privada. Lo público-privado tiene que funcionar de una vez por todas y, desde luego, eso sí, llevar a cabo políticas como, por ejemplo, la garantía juvenil que la Comisión Europea puso en marcha el pasado año, que es cierto que no nos parece ni mucho menos del todo suficiente, 6.000 millones no es suficiente para 5 millones de jóvenes en paro, pero en cualquier caso hemos iniciado el camino, aprendimos de los errores, sabemos qué camino hay que andar, empezamos a sumar iniciativas y, por supuesto, repito, hay que generar sinergias entre los diversos presupuestos para que de esta manera, junto con la participación privada, podamos resolver este que es de los más grandes problemas que tiene la Unión Europea. Okay, thank you very much for that. Elise? I will uh, ask the second question to Mr. Leterm, uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. In retrospect, and uh, seeing all these fiscal uh, measures that the Commission took in the crisis countries, was it the only alternative Did it go well? Was there a critical component, uh, component lacking uh, in these policies? What did go wrong? First of all, I would like to say that you were our opinion when you look at the way that uh, the Can so you please I, start, I start again? Your uh, first of all, I would like to say that when you look at um, the past six years, um, of course, we were in a learning curve. And certainly, I was then prime minister. The, The first reactions were, let's say, not uh, completely based on a kind of handbook, how you tackle a crisis. 
But when you compare it to crises of, for instance, the last century, I think globally spoken, the leadership, whether it be the leadership on the European level or in member states, uh, all these socio-economic partners reacted better and uh, have succeeded to tackle in a better way the crisis than it used to be in, in the 20th century. That having been said, I think indeed that the whole of the question is to strike a good balance between uh, adding credibility to the fiscal policy, to the fiscal position, uh, managing the issue of the public debt, uh, managing the, the budgets in the right way, but on the other hand, in the choice you make and the kind of tools you use to reduce deficit and to manage the debt, to make that choice that is the, less, the least contraproductive in terms of economic growth. And it is clear that now we have to have, on the one hand, we have to continue our efforts in terms of fiscal consolidation. We have to continue, still have to produce lots of effort to uh, strengthen the balance sheets of lots of systemic banks in, in the Eurozone, more specifically. And on the other hand, we have to strengthen our structural policy. And this is not always a question of adding money to the, uh, to the uh, having more expenditures. Sometimes you have very important measures in the range of structural policy that doesn't cost anything. Uh, so to, to sum up, I think there was no alternative than to address the uh, lack of trust, lack of confidence on the international, on level of international markets towards the refinancing needs and the payback capacities of public authorities. That was a fact, there was a, a mistrust. And so we had to address this by uh, showing that we were ready to, uh, to decide uh, measures in terms of fiscal consolidation and reducing the deficit. The other point is that the best way to reduce the deficit is to have enough economic growth and to have economic growth, and in fact, it's, it's more than six years already that we are uh, uh, fighting with that problem. It's already 15 to 20 years that Europe as a whole has a, a very low uh, pace of economic growth. So the second part is to have enough economic growth, which uh, makes it more easy to, to, to tackle the problem of the, of the fiscal uh, consolidation, the deficit and the debt. I would only want to add something is that, to our opinion as an OECD, what is underestimated at this very moment is that there is not only a problem in uh, some countries, uh, and this problem is already addressed, of the public debt, of the public deficit, don't underestimate the situation of lots of families in the private sector. The companies also, which have uh, a lot of problems on their balances, uh, which uh, have uh, contracted lots of loans, and so the private, the indebtedness of the private sector is often underestimated when you look at policies uh, when the Eurozone is, uh, is discussed and is debated like this morning. With a yes or no, do you think that the European countries now know not to moralize too much on the private debt? Do, will they correct these mistakes? I think there are still in the Eurozone and still uh, even some countries which are at, uh, let's say, uh, where the problems are not solved yet. And some of these countries still have very important problems in terms of private debt yet. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Costa, the economic crisis, of course, of the last five years, as you well know, has had a devastating impact on towns and cities around Europe. Businesses have closed. People have become unemployed. And a lot of people say that uh, the people in towns and cities, those who, are, who have a position of power, should have more of a role in how to get job, people back into jobs. So what do you think people like mayors like you can do to support, support, to support a more sustainable economic development and to get people back into jobs. Bom dia a todos. Queria agradecer esta, este debate. E acho que a estratégia Europa 2020 foi desenhada para ser executada a todos os níveis da governação. E que as cidades e as regiões têm aqui um papel absolutamente capital. Cada um fazendo de acordo com as competências diferentes que tem, cada um fazendo de acordo com as oportunidades que tem, mas é o objetivo de termos um crescimento inteligente, sustentável e inclusivo é um objetivo que tem que ser mobilizador e tem que representar uma nova etapa no nosso processo de integração europeia. E isso significa que temos que encontrar uma convergência de estratégias entre as políticas locais e a conclusão destes objetivos. É nas cidades, designadamente, que temos a massa crítica necessária para podermos ter um crescimento inteligente, 
onde temos o capital humano, onde temos os centros de investigação, de inovação, é nas cidades que se coloca o maior desafio do ponto de vista das alterações climáticas, com a regulação quer da eficiência energética dos transportes, quer da eficiência energética dos edifícios, e também é nas cidades que temos as maior, a maior intensidade de manchas de pobreza e taxas mais elevadas de desemprego. E essa é a grande oportunidade que temos neste momento para atacar essa chaga fundamental, que é o desemprego e, em particular, o desemprego jovem. E isso significa, por exemplo, numa cidade como a minha, que temos um grande esforço de investimento na reabilitação urbana para fazer, de identificar a oportunidade de termos fundos para fazer, para melhorar a eficiência energética dos edifícios, para potenciar a reabilitação urbana. E a reabilitação urbana é simultaneamente uma forma de aumentar a inclusão social, mas também de aumentar a nossa competitividade, designadamente, porque torna a cidade mais atrativa e potencia designadamente como destino turístico. E isso significa que no quadro da especialização inteligente da nossa cidade, o turismo é uma mais-valia significativa. E, portanto, temos que conseguir encontrar em cada uma das cidades aquilo que, aqueles que são os projetos que simultaneamente contribuem para termos um crescimento inteligente, sustentável e inclusivo e simultaneamente valoriza a nossa potencialidade, o nosso potencial, o nosso potencial económico e o nosso potencial de crescimento. E só assim conseguiremos vencer este drama relativo ao desemprego. Agora, há uma questão central que tem a ver que é com um dos efeitos mais dramáticos desta crise. Nós não teremos crescimento inteligente se não tivermos capital humano. E esta crise teve, de facto, um efeito muito assimétrico no conjunto dos países da União Europeia e não vale a pena termos essa ilusão que não foi assim. A descrição que aqui tivemos relativamente à situação da Grécia pode ser replicada em Espanha ou pode ser replicada em Portugal. Nós hoje temos uma nova onda de emigração das gerações mais qualificadas e que são aquelas que e eram aquelas, e é aquela geração que é uma condição essencial para podermos ter um modelo de crescimento diferente daquele que tivemos no passado. E se queremos ser, de facto, uma economia assente no conhecimento, nós não podemos ter regiões sem capital humano para o conhecimento. E a fixação desse capital humano nas regiões de origem é absolutamente essencial e acho que é um novo grande desafio para a política de coesão. Ok, thank you very much. Elias? Uh, I will ask uh, Mr. Valcartel. Uh, in a body like the community of region, uh, you deal firsthand with the disparities of the region uh, within, uh, between your various members, and, and it is a gap that it is growing. Do you see a multi-speed Europe as a setting that would allow this gap to start uh, shrinking again and convergence powers setting into motion? No es un riesgo, lamentablemente es una realidad. Decir otra cosa es sencillamente no querer ver las cosas tal cual son y es verdad que hay una Europa que va a velocidad, a ritmo mayor que otra parte de Europa y estoy pensando especialmente en países recién incorporados o recientemente incorporados a la Unión Europea y sobre todo países del sur. Hay diferencias, por tanto. Hay brecha entre regiones que disponen de mayores recursos frente a otras regiones que todavía no alcanzan el nivel de aquellas primeras. La cuestión no es si esta es o no la realidad, que es la realidad. La cuestión es si existen o no mecanismos para que esa brecha, lejos de agrandarse, se vaya estrechando y diremos que afortunadamente existen mecanismos yo creo que la política de cohesión es la que mejor define y desde luego la que de manera más efectiva puede hacer que ese logro que todos pretendemos al final sea la realidad que debe de ser por lo tanto cuando hemos tenido tantos debates sobre regiones objetivo 1 regiones que por efecto aritmético perdían su condición de objetivo 1, en cuyo caso dejaban de percibir fondos que antes sí que percibían, esto que llamamos pasar de ser regiones pobres, entre comillas, a ser regiones ricas, también entre comillas, al día siguiente por efecto estadístico, pero es cierto que 
los mecanismos son los que permiten precisamente evitar esas diferencias de tal suerte que recientemente se contempla también aquello que llamamos regiones en transición para que no dejen de ser pobres un día y ricas al otro día cuando realmente ni eran pobres ayer ni son ricas el día después. Luego, ¿existen diferencias? Existen, claro que sí. ¿Existen mecanismos? Afortunadamente también. Pero aquí es donde hay que poner toda la imaginación y la mayor voluntad para que al final eso que llamamos la solidaridad como principio básico que soporta el sentido real de la Unión Europea funcione en la medida en la que tiene que funcionar. Thank you very much. I will come back to you in a second because we also have some video questions for our panelists which are relevant to today's debate. So, let's take our first one. It comes from Jean-Louis Destin, who is a French member of the Committee of the Regions. If we can have the question. Peut-on imaginer uh, que à côté de l'Union économique et monétaire, nous puissions avoir un quatrième pilier qui soit uh, un pilier uh, non pas vertical et parallèle mais transversal, un pilier social qui nous permette de mieux avancer en Europe et de régler un certain nombre de problèmes structurels sociaux qui sont très lourds. And uh, I will go again to you, Mr. Valcarcel, for the answer to this question. Yo estoy de acuerdo en el planteamiento que hace el señor Destán. Es una pregunta que además yo creo que conlleva también la voluntad de que de alguna manera se establezcan eh, esos mecanismos a partir de ese pilar transversal que pueda conectar lo que es la política de las inversiones junto con la política social. Pero yo voy a decir algo, no, no creo yo que exista eh, ningún ente supranacional como la Unión Europea, ningún ente supranacional en ningún lugar del mundo en donde haya mayor voluntad y diré también mayor presupuesto orientado a las políticas sociales. Esta es una realidad, este es un hecho. Yo les voy a hablar de un ejemplo que nadie me ha contado porque soy yo quien lo aplica. En mi región el presupuesto ocupa el 85% para el gasto social, para las políticas sociales. Estoy hablando de sanidad, de educación, de políticas sociales en cuanto a dependencia, en cuanto eh, a discapacidad eh, psíquica, eh, intelectual o física. Es decir, estamos orientando esas políticas hoy más que nunca porque hoy hay mayor mayor vulnerabilidad que en ningún otro tiempo como efecto de la crisis. Ahora bien, es cierto que cuando hay tanta gente padeciendo los efectos de la crisis, parece que tenemos que poner mucho más el acento, como bien indica el señor Destán, en las políticas sociales. Thank you very much, Mr. Valcarcel. Karen. Well, thank you very much so far for your contributions. We're now about to end the first part of the debate and move on to the next segment. But before we do, we're going to take our first poll from our audience and we're going to get your views on a very pertinent question. So now let's have our first poll question. So, has the economic and financial crisis proved that we need more or less Europe? If you think we need more Europe, press one on your voter control machine if you think we need less Europe, press two. Okay, so just to explain, we're going to have a vote bar which will actually show your results. So we're just going to do that again. So we're going to, if I can ask you, those who think you need more Europe, vote one. Those who think you need less Europe, vote two, and we will see the bar come up with the results. Okay. Vote now. Okay, now you can start voting. So more Europe, vote one, or press one, less Europe, press two on your remote machine. Okay, so 77. 0.5% voted yes to say the economic and financial crisis proves that we need more Europe. 
and 22.5% say less. Uh, Mr. Valkersel, are you surprised by that? Just very briefly, your response. 77.5%. No, no me sorprende, creo que se ajusta un poco a la realidad de lo que pasa en el resto de la ciudadanía europea, somos representantes de los mismos. Yo, desde luego, si hubiera tenido la posibilidad de votar, no tengo consola y no puedo votar, hubiera votado, no les quepa, no les quepa la menor duda, más Europa, sin duda, más Europa. Ok, thank you. Mr. Leterme, on the same issue. Of course, uh, of course, more Europe is needed. Um, I was listening to the uh, member that asked for a social pillar. Uh, I think you cannot ask at this very moment to deliver in terms of social pillar from the European Union as it is now in terms of budget and in terms of competences. So if you want a real social policy, you have to work on economic convergence, on social cohesion, but this needs more means and, and uh, competences. And so the answer to uh, strengthening the effectiveness of policies is, of course, to have a subsidiarity approach, a multi-level governance, but where Europe can play a more important role than today in terms of budget and in terms of uh, competences, yeah. Thank you very much. Karen? Um, maybe, Mr. Castor, a very brief response from you as well, because many people might have thought the vote would be to say less Europe because a lot of people feel that the EU may have interfered too much in terms of imposing austerity measures on countries. Bom, eu acho que nós temos de ter mais Europa, mas também uma Europa diferente. Eu acho que, felizmente, vencemos a primeira fase da crise, que era saber se queríamos ou não queríamos todos continuar a partilhar uma moeda comum. Acho que agora temos que responder à segunda pergunta, que é o que é que temos que fazer para que esta moeda comum produza efeitos comuns no conjunto dos Estados. E aquilo que nós aprendemos com esta crise é que, de facto, as uniões monetárias não favorecem a convergência, mas favorecem a especialização das economias e, portanto, produzem efeitos assimétricos no conjunto do território da zona euro. E se nós queremos manter o euro, e creio que queremos, temos que agora fazer o resto, que é saber como corrigir os efeitos negativos do euro. E uma das coisas que é absolutamente essencial fazer é agora que estamos a chegar a um ponto de viragem nos programas de ajustamento, fazer o trabalho que falta fazer. É como quando alguém parte uma perna, tem uma fratura exposta e tem que ser operado. Essa é a fase da dor, mas não basta a dor para que se fique curado. Depois é necessário fazer fisioterapia, poder, poder recuperar a massa muscular perdida, poder recuperar a capacidade de mobilidade. E depois do programa de ajustamento, nós precisamos de um sério programa de fisioterapia que devolva músculo a todos estes países devastados pela crise. Um país com 28% de desemprego, como a Grécia, ou um país de 17% de desemprego, como em Portugal, ou de 20 e tal por cento, como a Espanha, se não tem, de facto, um forte choque vitamínico e se não tem um bom programa de fisioterapia que lhe devolva músculo, não recuperará, efetivamente, a sua capacidade de partilhar de uma forma positiva e benéfica os benefícios do euro. E nós queremos um euro para todos e que seja, de facto, uma moeda comum nos custos e nos benefícios. Ok, thank you very much. I think it's time now to move to our second part of the debate. Ilias. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, it is uh, the, second, the second strand will address the future of the EU. still has made huge leaps, but still finds itself torn between two concepts, national sovereignty on the one hand, federalism on the other hand, an internal conflict that has caused considerable damage during the crisis. Yet, despite this five-year broil, we still seem stuck in the same internal conflict, yes or no to Europe. However, that was a call for the post-war generation. Now, the, uh, the question is what Europe? And how can this debate move towards this long-term vision? I will start with Mr. Valcarcel. 
The antagonism that we see today between the core and the periphery reminds us, it echoes, like the old antagonism within the nation states, between the capital and the regions. Do you think that the Committee of the Regions, having this experience, this institutional uh, the, uh, background on that, could help in the wider issue of bridging this gap in the European Union? Bueno, eh, realmente el Comité de las Regiones lo que intenta precisamente es eso, salvar tales diferencias, aunque solo sea, fíjense, porque somos los representantes más directos de los ciudadanos, los más próximos a los ciudadanos, los que tenemos que estar día a día gestionando ya no solamente un presupuesto para dotar de la mayor calidad de vida posible a los ciudadanos, sino porque además gestionamos la frustración de los ciudadanos, gestionamos las esperanzas de los ciudadanos, gestionamos hasta los sueños de los ciudadanos. Es la proximidad, es la política que hace que al final termines identificándote al máximo con los ciudadanos. ¿Qué pretendemos desde el Comité de las Regiones? Precisamente eso. Es decir, acortar tales diferencias. Evitar, por tanto, que haya, si esto tiene mucha relación con la pregunta que usted me hacía antes, acerca de las velocidades distintas de determinadas regiones, de determinados países, de esas dos Europas de dos tiempos distintos, al final no deja de ser distinto a ello. Lo que pretendemos, en definitiva, desde el Comité, es una política más social, más equitativa, una política en donde, además, llevemos los problemas de los ciudadanos, los reales, los que estamos eh, palpando día a día pues a las instituciones europeas para que éstas, a su vez, desde su sensibilidad, que por supuesto la tienen, desde su legitimidad, que por supuesto la tienen, pero entre todos sumando para que al final esas diferencias dejen de serlo. Thank you very much. Karen. Uh, maybe if I can turn to you, Mr. Costa, and particularly address a question about May's European elections. Are you concerned that voters will turn to more radical Eurosceptic parties to express their discontent and their frustrations at EU institutions, their governments, their politicians, and their policies? Because in some EU countries, we've seen quite a significant shift in support for those more radical Eurosceptic parties. Bom, eu estou preocupado com os riscos de radicalização, mas estou mais preocupado em perceber porque é que enfrentamos estes riscos de radicalização. E a verdade é que estes riscos de radicalização existem por dois motivos essenciais. Por um lado, porque de facto a Europa deixou de ser, para muitos cidadãos, um fator de esperança. E em segundo lugar, porque as alternativas políticas no seio da União Europeia tornaram-se menos claras e menos visíveis. Não basta aos grandes partidos europeus terem dois candidatos diferentes a presidentes da Comissão para que as pessoas percepcionem essas candidaturas como candidaturas alternativas. E quando as alternativas não se jogam no campo democrático, necessariamente surgem no campo radical. E é isso que é necessário compreender e que é necessário corrigir. Eu acho que o grande erro, nós quando olhamos, vemos num momento paradoxal, entre este desânimo interno, e ao mesmo tempo a vermos as manifestações na Praça Maidana em Kiev, ou aquilo que é o um movimento de muitos subsaarianos em direção à Europa, percebemos como de facto temos o dever de defender um projeto que continua a ser um exemplo de paz, de coesão social, de progresso e de liberdade para milhões de seres humanos no mundo. Mas para o fazer temos que porventura voltar àquilo que é a raiz do nosso projeto europeu. Para os pais fundadores da Europa, a economia era um instrumento para uma comunidade política assente em valores culturais comuns e num modelo social que era comum. A economia não era o fim, era o um instrumento. E eu acho que foi no momento em que sobrepusemos a economia aos valores e ao modelo social que a Europa começou a desencantar os próprios europeus. E é importante identificar a causa, porque é a forma de, corrigir, de voltar a dar um passo ao lado e corrigir o que é necessário corrigir. E espero 
que depois deste período duro que temos vivido nestes últimos anos, possamos retomar aquilo que é essencial. E permitam-me, sendo socialista, que cite um notável conservador, que foi o Winston Churchill, e quando, durante a Segunda Guerra, se discutia se deviam ou não deviam fazer cortes no orçamento da cultura, respondeu, se não é pela cultura que nós nos batemos, porquê é que nós nos estamos a bater? E essa é a questão que temos que responder aos europeus. Por que razão, porquê é que nos estamos a bater e porquê é que suportamos estes sacrifícios? Isto tem que fazer um sentido, e só faz sentido, se for em nome de valores e em nome do modelo social, que é o nosso e que queremos defender. Ok, Mr. Costa, thank you. Elias? Thank you very much, Karen. Mr. Valcarcel, how would you propose to win back the, the support and the trust of the citizens, especially the ones that have lost their jobs, their security, and especially the ones that blame people, rightly or wrongly, like you for their predicament? No, no estamos en el mejor momento, desde luego, como para ver facilidad en la recuperación de la confianza de los ciudadanos en la Unión Europea y en los políticos. Pero, como bien dijo también el presidente Esguros, eh, lo que no podemos es ni arrojar la toalla ni llorar por las esquinas. Hay que hacer frente, hay que reaccionar ante esta situación y hay que saber explicar exactamente para qué vale este invento llamado Unión Europea. A los ciudadanos podemos eh, explicarles las cosas con grandes discursos y al final los ciudadanos darán la espalda a los políticos porque no hemos descendido al detalle. Ahora toca descender al detalle. Ahora toca hablar exactamente de qué es lo que hace Europa por los ciudadanos. Ya no los políticos, que es un concepto hoy bastante depreciado, pero sí qué está haciendo Europa. Es que cuando una persona va a un hospital en cualquier rincón de la Unión Europea, ese hospital ha sido construido con fondos europeos en la mayor parte. O cuando nuestros hijos van a los colegios públicos, esos colegios han sido levantados con presupuesto europeo en la mayor parte. Y cuando discurrimos por las carreteras, esas carreteras han sido asimismo sí costeadas por la Unión Europea y las depuradoras y tantas y tantas cosas más. Esto es lo que hay que explicar a los ciudadanos. Europa no es el problema. Europa es la solución al problema. Es la que está dando posibilidad para que ese estado de bienestar se consolida como tal. Esto es fundamental y hay que explicarlo así, con mucha humildad, por supuesto, pero también con el ímpetu de saber que esto es bueno para los ciudadanos. Europa es lo mejor que ha podido pasar a la propia historia de la Unión Europea. 69 años de paz jamás se había producido un periodo como este. Y además de prosperidad, pese a que ahora una crisis tremenda como esta se lleva por delante tantas cosas, pero junto con ello hablemos también no solamente del efecto economicista de construir hospitales, colegios y los principios, y los principios, porque donde se acaban las fronteras europeas es cuando empiezan los problemas, entre otros el de Ucrania, como bien hacía referencia el alcalde Costa. Por tanto, los principios son elementos básicos también. Es que la libertad no llega porque sí, hay que cultivarla todos los días, creyendo en ello profundamente. Es que la participación, la descentralización, la transparencia, la democracia en definitiva, la paz, eso es Europa también. Y esto es lo que hay que explicarle a los ciudadanos. Es mejor esto que no sea algo similar a esto. Thank you very much. Karen. Mr. Leterme, if I can perhaps direct this question to you, and, and you were here yesterday at the summit and would have heard about the growing economic and social disparities that people were talking about that has increased between regions in the European Union. And it seems that European trend of inequality and disparity between places is increasing worldwide. What do you think regional and local authorities can do in Europe to reverse this trend and to try to create greater equality between all regions and cities in Europe? Well, I think it was put very clear due to what happened during the last couple of years in terms of fiscal consolidation, that in the future, whatever happens, public authorities, globally spoken, 
will have to perform better with less money, doing more in favor of the citizens with less money. And you can manage this only by improving the efficiency, the effectiveness of the efforts. And very important in that field is to acknowledge that the one size fits all, the one solution for all problems all over, the, all over Europe is not the right approach, that you have to have um, tailor-made solutions based, once again, Luc van der Brand explained it yesterday in this meeting, multi-level governments, alignment of policies. But in that framework, local and regional authorities, so cities and regions and provinces, have a very important role to play. And I don't like the kind of game to blame each other, saying the European Union is wrong, the national governments are wrong. No, the local authorities sometimes have good policies, bad policies. Anyway, what is very important, I think, is at least in terms of social cohesion, which is only based, also based on economic conversion, in terms of social cohesion, I think at least three elements could improve the situation on the initiative of the local authorities. First of all, I think priority number one, and it has been addressed already by the President here, it is the inclusive labor market policy, especially towards young people. What is happening now with thousands, ten thousands of young people that are unemployed, that are not in education nor in, in employment, that are left aside at the margins of society, this is a ticking bomb. And so we have to address this, and you can address this, of course, in strengthening your economy competitiveness, in working on the unit labor cost, for instance, that's more the the domain of the national authorities, but on the local level, on the regional level, having tailor-made solutions adapted to the specific situation of cities, of parts of the labor market, this is very important. And there, of course, the local authority has a good view on the situation and has to give a very important priority to help to address this very important issue of inclusive labor market solution uh, policies, policies that don't let outside of the labor market any people. Secondly, entrepreneurship. There are also corporate taxes, incentives, and so on. That's more the domain of the European, of the national governments. But for instance, incubators, improving the uh, framework, the conditions for people to start up new enterprises. You know, Europe is a little bit lagging behind. Europe is a, is a, is a continent of small and medium enterprises, was a continent of entrepreneurship. And when you compare it to economies like uh, South Korea, but also emerging economies like Brazil and others, you see that entrepreneurship, the number of people that take the risk to start up an enterprise is decreasing, is, is too low. And so there I think local authorities can take initiatives to facilitate the, the work startups have, uh, have to do. Last but not least, we've been talking about yesterday, about this yesterday. Of course, regional and local authorities are the main public investors all over the place, and especially in Europe. I think two-thirds, approximately, of the investment of public authorities goes through local and regional initiatives. And there have a contra-cyclical approach. I mean, like it was traditionally the case, uh, increasing the efforts in terms of investment in infrastructure, in productive investment, instead of decreasing it when it is crisis. Of course, you have your fiscal consolidation issue, but within this tight framework of fiscal consolidation, giving priority to productive investment is also a very important task of local authorities and regional authorities. So to sum up, yes, they have a very important role to play in terms of strengthening the social cohesion, in terms of tackling inequalities, amongst other, by the inclusive labor market policy, by enhancing the chances for people to start up enterprises and by a very active contracyclical investment policy. Well, you mentioned the ticking time bomb there of young people and actually that's the focus of our next video question which we're going to take now. And this one comes from Sonia Massini who is an Italian member of the Committee of the Regions. Io vorrei chiedere quale ruolo avranno i giovani nelle future elezioni europee perché questi sono i cittadini che stanno costruendo la nuova Europa che forse non è l'Europa delle istituzioni ma è l'Europa vera che cambierà, io credo, anche il modo di vivere insieme. Allora che ruolo avranno per combattere l'euroscetticismo? Come li faremo sentire protagonisti? Maybe Mr. Leterme again, just very briefly, how can we use young people here in a very positive way to fight growing Euroscepticism in Europe? I think um, since some decades, and we underestimate that fact, 
I think Europe has become a institutional level like we have other institutions. And key for the credibility of institutions, whether it be international organizations or local authorities, is that they deliver, that citizens feel that they are of added value, that they bring solutions. And once again, you cannot ask solutions from an European level, which is very shrinked in terms of budgetary means and in terms of competences, but there are domains where Europe makes the difference and where we have to explain it to people. But also there, I think that cooperation between levels of governance, together with the European people, not blaming each other about what's happening and giving the fall to each other, but working together and showing to people that uh, in, in having a strong cooperation between levels of governance, you can solve not only problems that are far away from their reality, but also problems that stick to their daily life, for instance, in terms of unemployment and having chances for a good, uh, a good job. I think this is really key, this is really the essence, and finding solutions through uh, debates and through policy measures that take them on board, not imposing solutions, but uh, building, designing uh, policies based on the interaction with young people. This is really very important. We have to solve the problems of young unemployed people. We have to solve it together with them in an interaction with them directly. Thank okay. you very much. Elias? Our second question comes from the Committee of the Regions member, Mr. Pavel Brenda. I will ask for a really uh, short uh, answer from Mr. Costa because we're already uh, out of schedule. Thank you. My first question is, what would be the role of the region so that the voice of regional political authorities was very clearly heard in this decision process. The second question is, Jestli by výbor regionu například nemohl být součástí tzv. trialogů, aspoň jako pozorovatel, to znamená, že by se účastnil vyjednávání o legislativních návrzích mezi radou, komisí a parlamentem. Is this a valid proposal? Can it work like that? Bom, o tratado de Lisboa vai dar um novo papel e importante papel ao comitê das ao comitê das regiões. Mas naturalmente, os tratados não começam nem acabam na sua letra. A letra é só o princípio. A partir daí há toda uma dinâmica, todo um processo. E tenho a certeza que ao longo dos próximos anos o Comitê das Regiões vai evoluir na sua presença e participação no seio da União Europeia. Aliás, recentemente, esta semana, ou a semana passada, a mesa do Parlamento aprovou uma declaração sobre a Carta de Governação Multinível que define bem a ambição que o Parlamento Europeu tem para ter uma presença mais ativa em todo o processo de governação da União Europeia e designadamente também no processo legislativo. Thank you very much, Mr. Costa. It's nearly time to move into the third segment, but before that we have another vote for you. Take your telecontrols and uh, let's see our second poll question, please. Do you think the voice of the citizens should be better heard in Europe? If you believe yes, press one. If you uh, uh, believe that no, press two. I will give you the start voting now. It is a trick question. <laughs> well. The, the answer is predictable and it's telling. I don't know if it's a positive uh, sign, Mr. Valcartel, or it's an alarm bell. No, no, absolutely positive. No requiere ni tan siquiera la más mínima explicación. Yo creo que es, es lo más normal del mundo. Ahora estamos expectantes a ver dónde está el truco. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Mr. Leterme for uh, his reaction. Do you think that uh, basically the answer tells us that the voice of people doesn't reach properly? What can be done to improve it? I think the people uh, have the feeling and are frustrated when institutions, when, when the, the situation doesn't improve and try to, to find who's to blame. And then they uh, look at uh, the people and the, the institutions that are more uh, more or less central in the, in the media. And, and so Europe is at, uh, at the core of the whole of the political debate, so it's quite normal that they uh, blame Europe for some of their problems uh, in their daily life. 
But uh, to be very honest, I think it's very important that we have democracy, that we have direct elections. But uh, uh, even as important as that is to deliver solutions to the people. And it's to, I think that will make the difference in terms of legitimacy and in terms of adherence of people to the European ideas is, uh, let's say, in the coming years, having a strong European Commission, a strong European Parliament, and a Council that really acts in the favour of, uh, of integration and cooperation. I think uh, people are sometimes... Uh, more aware of what's happening than we don't underestimate people than we think. Thank you very much, Mr. Laterme. Thank you very much, Mr. Costa, for your contribution. We are reaching the end of the second uh, strand of our uh, debate, and we're moving to the third. You can take your seats. Thank you very much. Karen? Thank you very much. Well, we've now come to the third and final strand of today's debate, which addresses the key challenges that the European Union is likely to face in the future. And I would now like to ask us to join us, the President of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso. Mr. Barroso, you've seen a lot of uh, things during the last 10 years that you are presiding the European Commission. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you how confident you are that uh, the current policy will not lead to even bigger inequality, even more extremism in the European Union. What is the absolute political priority for the EU in order to avoid that? First of all, good morning to everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Ramon, my good friend, and also the president of the region of Attica, and I will answer directly your question. The absolute priority is jobs, jobs, and jobs, employment. And for that, we need growth. We have gone through the most difficult part of the crisis. I believe the most difficult part is behind us. Some countries, including this country, Greece, my own country, Portugal, Ireland, Cyprus, were in a desperate situation. I'm not exaggerating the word, desperate. It could have been much, much worse. Some of the countries had not the money to pay the salaries until the end of the year, when they've asked for support from the European Union. And so I know that many sacrifices were asked, but frankly, I think there was basically no other way. Because if the countries in, co in question would not be able to show determination to correct some of the problems in terms of huge deficits or in terms of a completely unacceptable behavior from the banks, then there will not have been possible to restore confidence. Confidence is now coming back. Ireland exited the program. Ireland is now having a good level of growth. Portugal, my country, will exit the program in May. Greece, according to our estimates, will have a primary surplus that did not happen in 60 years. And now we expect already this year growth of around 0.9, and next year uh, even um, above 2%. So we know the difficulties, but you are also leaders. You are leaders of the regions or the cities. You know very well that nothing comes without effort. And we have to be realistic. It was very important to show the capacity to control the huge deficits, to put the banks in order. We are still doing that. But now I think we have to come to a second phase, a phase where growth is, of course, uh, the center, the center of all our actions. But frankly, we could not have growth if we did not make this kind of corrections of some imbalances. Because we have seen, and I think all of us have learned the lesson, that growth supported or based on high levels of debt, public debt, 
or private debt is simply not sustainable. That is artificial growth. And now what we need is sustainable growth, more inclusive growth, and I'm confident that the European economy is going to get out of this crisis stronger than before, resilient, and we have already seen now that the first signs of recovery are there. Because we live in a world, we are not out of the world, a world where there is tough competition and we have to become more competitive. So we have to pursue some reforms to make our economy, our economies, because there are different situations in Europe, fit for globalization, fit for the 21st century. So based on the 10 years of experience that you mentioned, and sometimes working, I can tell you, day and night, day and night, looking at the spreads of all the countries. I, I tell you that I'm confident about the future of Greece, of the so-called more vulnerable economies, and of the European Union and the Euro area as a whole. Uh, I want to build a little bit on this message of uh, hope that you have, because we often speak about microeconomic uh, uh, elements, but the people of Greece are suffering blows to their finances and also to their dignity for, for years now. And now they feel uh, also hostage to a friction between the creditors. What is the message of hope that you can give to the Greeks for, in terms of their future uh, within the EU? I trust very much Greece. I admire very much this country. I know the resilience of Greece and the Greek people. I've been all over the world, and all over the world I've met very dynamic Greek communities. So frankly, I think this country has all the resources to be a leading country. I'm against stereotypes and prejudices. Things can change for the better. Just an example. Greece was, until two years ago, one of the worst performers in terms of absorption of the structural funds. It was one of the three countries that were less able to use the structural funds, the regional funds. I have created a task force for Greece. We have cooperated with the Greek authorities. Now Greece is the fourth. Among 28 countries, Greece is one of the top performers. So you see, there is no fatality. Things can change for the better. And I'm sure that Greece that over the centuries has shown this resilience is now able also to correct some of the problems that exist in this country, and we know what they are, in terms of the public administration, in terms still of, now it's been correcting, but in fact, tax evasion, tax fraud, problems that exist also in the way the state relates to the society and the society to the state. This is uh, something that is very important. And we have seen that now, this year, we already expect positive growth to Greece. Next year, as well, even uh, bigger. So imbalances are being corrected. I personally believe that uh, the efforts of Greece and the reforms have been underestimated. And there are some reasons, objective reasons, why Greece was not doing so well, let me be very frank with you, as Ireland or, or Portugal. The reasons were, first of all, Greece was getting that crisis in the most difficult moment also for the euro area. And so there was a lot of skepticism around the world. Do you remember that some time ago people were pre pre predicting the implosion of the euro. I was have, uh, speaking with President Obama, with President Putin, with pri presidents or prime and prime minister of China, the prime minister of Japan, Brazil, and they were asking me in the G20, do you believe the euro is going to resist or it's going to implode? Do you believe the European Union will be able to stay or will be the disintegration of Europe? And I've said always, I believe it's going to stay. But don't you think that Greece has to exit the euro? In the January 2012, I invited the chief economists of the most important banks in Europe to have a brainstorm in the European Commission in Brussels. Do you know what happened? All of them, except one, said by the end of this year, 2012, Greece will be out of the euro. And I said, you are wrong. Greece will be in the euro. <laughs> because they were underestimating the political factor. They were underestimating that in spite 
of all the difficulties, the Greek people that is very committed to Europe wanted to stay in the euro, we do not want to fall in another uh, category. So the point is that extraordinary resilience. But there was another two points that were making the life of Greece more difficult. Not only they were the first, the Greeks, to suffer the first impact, they were also the country where there were very difficult uh, political situation. Elections, instability, governments following, uh, all these comments about the referendum created instability, uncertainty, and you know investors do not like uncertainty. So the political management here was not the best. Third, and this is important for you to know, the comments coming from outside, including from some members of the euro area, saying that Greece will not be able to do it was extremely negative. While regarding Ireland, there was since the beginning a positive expectation, regarding Portugal, relatively positive. Regarding Greece, there were messages coming from the outside saying Greece is not going to do it. And that had a very negative impact in the markets and the market's perception. This explains why the Greek case is to some extent special. But Greece was able to resist to this. And that's why I'm sure that if there are no errors and if there are no complacency now, if Greece remains committed to the reforms, and we are now, uh, I hope, finalizing, I would like this next week, I hope, but depends also on the Greek side, finalize this review, I believe there is no reason why Greece would be less able than Ireland or Portugal or, or Cyprus that is also making our big efforts and Greece will not be able to join the, the, the group of the most, let's say, uh, successful, economies, successful economies. There are some prejudices in Europe. I'm a man from the south. My country is from Europe, from Portugal, from the, uh, from the south of Europe. I know that sometimes there are cultural prejudices. I don't like those stereotypes or prejudices. I'm sure that the Greeks are as able as any other in Europe, and I've seen that in my life. So my message to Greece is one of hope, and we as the European Union will stay to support Greece, provided, of course, the Greeks are able to stay the course of it, what is more competitiveness, and now to make the necessary reforms to have sustainable growth. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Karen. Thank you very much, Mr. Barroso. And I may move the next question a little bit beyond the terrain of the European Union itself, because it's about Ukraine. Um, and of course, we're here at a time when the crisis in Ukraine is dominating global headlines. It's an extremely fluid and dangerous situation there at the moment, as you well know. Crimea wants a referendum now on whether to join Russia or stay with Ukraine. The security situation there remains extremely tense. Russia's warning against having sanctions imposed on it. Now, the EU, of course, has been involved in the Ukrainian situation for some time now. But right now, what do you think are the most effective steps that the EU can take to try to resolve this crisis in Ukraine? Some of the steps were already adopted unanimously by the heads of state and government in Brussels the day before yesterday. I was in that meeting, and I was very happy to see that all the 28 heads of state and government were able to agree on a common set of measures, political, diplomatic, also economic. Political and diplomatic showing clearly that uh, what is happening in terms of uh, um, not respecting the unity or territorial integrity of a country is simply not acceptable and that there will be consequences if this is not respected. There was a very firm reaction from all the heads of state and government. We received in Brussels Prime Minister Yartsenyuk. Um, it was a very good meeting, expressing also our political solidarity with the government and the people of Ukraine. But we went beyond that. The day before the European Council, the European Commission presented a package of financial support to Ukraine that is around 11 billion euros for the next years, but we consider their grants and loans 
It's not all grants. Part is loans. Part of it will be given through the European Investment Bank and the EBRD, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. And we are now working to do everything to put as soon as possible the necessary macrofinancial assistance because uh, um, Ukraine has a problem of treasury. Uh, so I think this was also a very good manifestation of the solidarity. It's a very complex issue, as you know, Ukraine, but it's in a way a lesson. During all these months, when the previous president of Ukraine did not want to sign the agreement of association with us that uh, it was already initialed, we saw, million, uh, we saw thousands and thousands of people by freezing temperatures waving the European flag, showing their adherence to the European values. They want to live like we live in the European Union. We have many problems, but we have uh, a respect for human rights, rule of law, and we have a certain level of prosperity. More than 100 people already died for these values in Europe. In Ukraine, so to follow the values of Europe. I think we have a, debt, a, a, a duty of solidarity with that country, and we'll work to have them as close as possible to us. We have decided also immediately to uh, sign, because it was requested by the Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, sign the uh, political chapters of the association agreement, which means that Ukraine will seal its association with the European Union. That's what I think what we can do and should do now, but of course we'll do it in a way, and we are trying to do it in a way that is peaceful. Our goal for Ukraine is very clear. It's peace, stability, prosperity. We don't have any ambition regarding Ukraine. What you want them is to decide their future. And we are trying to make clear to our Russian partners that our the association of Ukraine to the European Union is not against uh, Russian interests. We don't want a confrontation about uh, Ukraine. I think it's not acceptable that in the 21st century we still have this issue of balance of power between countries and the annexation of parts of another country. This is simply not acceptable. What we need is to have peace and regional peace, continental peace, and global peace. That's why I still hope that there will be an effort to achieve a peaceful solution, a negotiated solution, that has to include, of course, the government of Ukraine, and we as the European Union are, together with our partners, together, of course, with the United Nations, ready to work for peace in Ukraine and peace for all Europe, because peace is the most valuable uh, good that we have in Europe. That is something that we were able to keep in Europe also because of the European Union. That's why two years ago we have received, I was part of that ceremony with such honor, we have received the Nobel Peace Prize. It was thanks to Europe that we have been built and consolidating uh, peace in all this continent, thanks to the European Union. We have the same approach to Ukraine. Let's hope that all the others have the same approach and that we can de-escalate the situation and let that country decide their future. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Barroso. Perhaps, um, thank you. Perhaps, Mr. Valcarcel, we could get your responses to what Mr. Barroso has just said. It's difficult to add something more to what the President Barroso said about Ukraine. I was in Ukraine. A group of members of the Committee of the Regions was in the month of January of this year in Kiev. Nos pudimos entrevistar con autoridades locales y regionales y de manera muy especial con quienes ejercían la oposición en la ya famosa Plaza Maidán. Además, tuvimos también un encuentro con la hija de Yulia Timoshenko, que fue, por cierto, un testimonio estremecedor de lo que significa la ausencia de libertad. Y permítanme que diga más, y también de crueldad, de un gobierno, aquel, aquel, que era un gobierno corrupto y un gobierno de criminales. Lo dijimos en Kiev y no hay razones para repetirlo aquí en Atenas. En definitiva, es lo que pudimos ver, es lo que pudimos oír y es lo que nos reforzó mucho más 
en la idea de que la Unión Europea es necesaria, pese a la situación económica, pese a la caída de valores, pese a la frustración de tantas y tantas personas que han sido arrastradas por la crisis que de tal manera nos ha dañado. Sin embargo, Europa, en un momento en donde vivíamos la realidad de Ucrania, Europa brillaba con más luz que nunca en nuestros corazones. Se hacía más importante que nunca, porque, como dije antes, donde terminan las fronteras europeas, es muy probable que se inicien los problemas como efectivamente Ucrania lo ha tenido y lo sigue teniendo. Por lo tanto, comprenderá que cuando hemos visto banderas europeas que se enarbolaban en Ucrania, lo cual ponía en riesgo la integridad física. ¿Cuántas personas han perdido la vida? Casi un centenar. Chocaba. Resultaba impactante que, sin embargo, en la Unión Europea quemáramos banderas europeas, como también hemos visto. Esa contradicción no puede ser. Por eso hay que hacer valor, hay que hacer valer la idea, el valor de la Unión Europea y apoyar a quienes quieren estar aquí con nosotros, dando la vida incluso por ello, como es el pueblo ucraniano. Thank you very much, Mr. Valcarcel. And perhaps I could ask you to remain seated. And if I can invite you now, Mr. Barroso, to make well, your keynote at this point, address. Uh, at this point, Mr. Valcarcel uh, can go to uh, join the rest of the uh, uh, people. Okay. Oh, we'll have the keynote uh, speech by Mr. Barroso. <laughs> ¿Me permiten solamente un minuto, presidente favor, Barroso? Porque esta va a ser mi última intervención y no querría de decir algo que creo que hay que decir. En primer lugar, mi agradecimiento al presidente Barroso porque está aquí dando una vez más importancia al Comité de las Regiones. Un presidente que ha creído, cree y seguirá creyendo en lo que representamos aquellos que estamos al frente de responsabilidades tanto en ayuntamientos como en regiones. Gracias, una vez más, presidente Barroso. Y mi felicitación al presidente Esguros. Desde el primer momento, contra viento y marea, con tantas dificultades. Creyó que había que celebrar la cumbre aquí en Atenas. No eran tiempos fáciles, las circunstancias no acompañaban, pero se empeñó, se empeñó y organizó esta cumbre. Así pues, querido presidente Esguros, enhorabuena en nombre de todos los miembros del Comité de las Regiones. Ha sido ciertamente una cumbre memorable, perfectamente organizada con la hospitalidad y el calor humano que caracteriza a los griegos. Y esto hace grande no solamente a Atenas, no solamente a Grecia, sino también al propio Comité de las Regiones. Muchísimas gracias, querido presidente Esguros. Y a ustedes, gracias por su atención.